was more than appropriate that President Trump meet with Vladimir Putin. And my own personal opinion is I think we need to de-escalate some of the partisan tensions in our country and try to look towards uh, ways that we can have discussions with foreign leaders and not be so simplistic that somehow they have to have a perfect record or that we have to shout and scream. I mean, I think back to Reagan talking to Gorbachev. He said, tear down that wall. He called him an evil empire. But I just don't imagine Reagan sitting down with Gorbachev and yelling and screaming and shaking his fist and saying, murder or thug and reciting the Stalin's uh, human rights abuses. So I think there is a difference for anybody who's ever thought about this between sitting down and how diplomacy would occur between individuals and reciting a litany of uh, human rights abuses. In that vein, I think there is, there seems to be sort of a limitless appetite for more sanctions, but maybe insufficient interest in describing what actions are needed to remove sanctions. And so Senator Rubio mentioned this deter act. I guess my concern with some of this is, is that the definition of who might be meddling in an, effect, in an election in our country is not limited just to Russia. It could include even allies who spend money on social media somehow in our country. It doesn't seem to differentiate between social media and actually hacking into our electoral system and changing thousands of votes. It also takes the power away from the president and gives it to the director of national intelligence. This is the deter act we were talking about. And I know you indicated that, well, sanctions are probably a good idea to deter them. But do you think it's a good idea to take the sanction power, give it to the DNI, and then the sanctions have to remain in place for eight hours with the president not having any ability to decide whether there's been some kind of change in behavior by the malefactors? Senator, without having seen the legislation, I do not think that's a good idea. Okay. The, uh, I liked in your statement where, I, where you said, the President Trump believes that now is the time for direct communication in our relationship in order to make clear to President Putin that there is the possibility to reverse the negative course of our relationship. And I think that gets at the heart of why we have these discussions. So if you heap sanctions on and Congress puts them on and they have to stay on for eight years and they can never come off, if there is no off-ramp, if there is no discussion, that's sort of what diplomacy is supposed to be about. So I do commend you for talking to Kim. Are we here to extol Kim's record on human rights? Obviously not. But at the same time, for sanctions to have an effect, you have to have negotiation. So what I would say to my colleagues who've been all over TV saying there should not have been a meeting, think again. Just keep heaping these sanctions on, and you don't want any ability to talk to the adversary about how we would actually remove the sanctions if behavior changed. You've got to have communications, not to mention the fact that we have planes flying within a mile or within 100 yards of each other in Syria. We have to have open lines of communication. So what I would ask is that we try to de-escalate the partisanship in our country so we can once again be open to some kind of uh, diplomacy. I have one question with regard to Iran, and you and I differ on, on the Iranian, the possibility of Iranian, uh, a further Iranian agreement. I think it's actually much more difficult, and I had my own criticisms of the nuclear agreement. I didn't think it was perfect, and yet I would have tried to have built upon it rather than destroy it. We had a lot of money at the time that was a carrot to try to bring Iran to the table, but now we have, instead of one issue, we have two, or instead of a smaller group of issues, we have a bigger group of issues. The nuclear issues are back on the table if we have to renegotiate the nuclear agreement and the ballistic missile issue. And the point that I think that we need to think through in discussions with Iran is that I think Iran, from their perspective, would see getting rid of their ballistic missile program as basically unilateral surrender. It's not my viewpoint. I think it's what I believe to be their viewpoint. I think they also see Saudi Arabia as a great adversary, and I think they see Israel as a potential adversary. And so I don't think unless, you know, it'd be great if you got all three to come together and have a multilateral agreement on not developing nuclear weapons and not having ballistic missiles. I don't see the other two coming to the table, frankly, to do that. And so I think in moving forward, I think it's just important that you, that you understand this isn't going to be easy. The first Iran agreement also was a multilateral agreement. You had multilateral sanctions. You now have more unilateral sanctions, and you're going to have a unilateral agreement that's sort of your own agreement. So um, I just think we shouldn't be so optimistic. And I guess I'd like to hear from you. How do you, uh, what makes you believe that Iran will come to the table to discuss ballistic missiles? Senator, I, I'm under no illusions about uh, how important um, Iran views its ballistic missile program. I, I, I agree with you there. 
uh, the question for President, that President Trump faced was, was the JCPOA good enough? He concluded it wasn't remotely good enough. I think he said it was the, one of the worst deals in history. I don't want to get the language wrong. And so he concluded um, we would find ourselves in a better place with an opportunity to revisit all of these issues, the broad spectrum of issues, not just the nuclear portfolio, but the missile program, uh, their malign activity around the world, all of them in a package. Um, it did accept the, the understanding that there would be those that wouldn't come alongside of us. Um, but you should know there is a coalition. It's not, it's not America and America alone. Um, we have others who believe that this was the right decision too. The Israelis, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, uh, other smaller European governments, not the E3 themselves. Um, but there are a number of folks who are beginning to coalesce around an understanding of how we can appropriately respond to Iran to take down uh, their, the nuclear risk to the United States as well as the risk from these other malign activities. Thank you. Senator Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Pompeo, for your service. Secretary Pompeo, we have uh, quite the record of President Trump's uh, business relations with Russia. Uh, extensive reporting and public records show a large amount of money from former Soviet states and Russia into Trump projects. Uh, Trump International Tower and Hotel in Toronto, the Trump Hotel in Panama, the uh, Trump Project in Soho and New York City are a few of the, the big examples here. And here's another one. A Russian oligarch bought a property from President Trump for uh, 95, candidate Trump at the time, or maybe a little before, for 95 million in 2008, less than four years after President Trump paid 41 million. So he more than doubled this money. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. in 2008 stated at a real estate conference in New York, and I quote here, Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of a lot of our assets, end quote. Uh, Donald Trump tried to build a Trump Tower in Moscow for 30 years. He even tweeted in 2013, Trump Tower Moscow is next, that's in quotes. In 2015, answering a question from indicted Russian operative and alleged spy Maria Butina, candidate Trump made clear his desires with Russia, stating, I would get along well with Putin and that I don't think we need the sanctions. Now the Russian ambassador to the United States has said the president made, and this is his quote, important verbal agreements with President Putin. And he seems to know more about uh, more about Helsinki and what happened there than the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. As we saw in Helsinki and throughout his presidency in the campaign, this president is extremely sympathetic to the very Russian government that attacked and continues to attack our democracy and those of our allies. It's a fact of political life today that many Americans are concerned about the unthinkable that a U.S. president could have compromised a compromising relationship with a foreign power. The president could clear this all up in three simple ways. Releasing his tax returns and those of the Trump Organization and the taxes from the various family businesses, some of which we don't even know about. After Helsinki, do you think that the American people deserve to know what's in President Trump's tax returns and business interests that, that are intertwined with Russia? Senator, I'm going to try to stay out of the uh, same uh, political circus that you and I ended up in last time I was sitting here and simply respond by saying uh, this same president with which you seem to express such deep concern is engaged in a massive defense buildup which threatens Vladimir Putin's regime. He instructed us to put together a nuclear posture review that has set Vladimir Putin on his ear because of its robustness and the recapitalization of our nuclear program. He's kicked out 60 spies. We've banned Kaspersky. Yeah, we put $11 billion in the Sec European Mr. Defense Secretary, Initiative. Mr. Secretary, you've already No, Senator, said actually, that. I haven't even begun to scratch No, 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 surface. but you've already, you haven't answered my question, so let me try it a little different way. Wouldn't you want to know, as Secretary of State, I mean, I, I'm taking you in your sincerity here as Secretary of State, whether all these Russian financial interests, oligarchs, and others are part of the decision-making of the president. I mean, wouldn't you want that out in the open and to understand what went on at Helsinki? It's, it's an easy kind of yes or no question. Senator, I don't need secondhand understandings of what President Trump is instructing 
his administration to do to push back against Rust. I have firsthand understanding yeah, well, and, uh, and directive. Well, let and me I'll ask just, the question we, a little we, bit we, different We've opposed here. Nord Stream 2. We've got a 4 by 30 out of NATO that, that also is a big setback for Russia. I mean, I, I'm happy to continue the list. I'm, I'm happy yeah, uh, to, well, to cease there, but I, I, will, I will submit the entirety of this administration's actions against Russia for please, the record, if I might. Please do. We'll back a truck up and get it on in here. Yeah, Sorry. candidate uh, Trump has failed to keep his promise to disclose his tax returns. Every presidential candidate since Richard Nixon has disclosed. Jimmy Carter even sold his peanut farm to avoid a conflict of interest. The situation with President Trump's potential foreign policy conflicts of interest is unprecedented and unacceptable. And under the Emoluments Clause, I think it's unconstitutional as well. But let me just ask a couple of questions about Helsinki. You talked about what you were tasked with. Um, the Director of National Intelligence, Coates, stated that at the Aspen Security Forum that he did not know what happened during the one-on-one -on -one meeting in Helsinki. Did the President personally debrief you on this conversation? And are you 100% confident that you know everything that President Trump discussed with President Putin. That's a very easy yes or no. If you don't want an answer at all, move on to the next one. I'm very so yes or a no. I'm very confident that I received a comprehensive debriefing from President Trump. Good, okay. Now, do you know for a fact whether President Trump or President Putin discussed any investments in Trump properties or any Trump projects, such as the previous attempt to build a Trump real estate project in Moscow? Senator, again, I'm going to try and stay out of the political circus. No, but were that you, question, question sir, were you, were you tasked with that? You I gave came, us a list came, of what you were I came here to talk about American foreign policy today. I have attempted to articulate President Trump's all, policy. All of these to business Russia. interests are entwined, sir, with our foreign policy. Yes, a foreign policy that has led to a massive defense buildup, a nuclear posture review that has frightened Vladimir Putin, all, uh, 60 spies, I mean, 219, 213 sanctions. Let me also ask you about an, an additional question on Helsinki. When I was a member when, of Congress, I tried desperately to get President Obama to do one of those things. When, it was when President Trump hosted top Russian officials at the White House last year, he bragged about how he had fired James Comey. Uh, at his press conference with Putin, President Trump called Special Counselor Mueller's investigation a disaster for the country. Can you tell us what President Trump discussed about the investigation during his private meeting with President Putin. Uh, I, I'm not gonna talk about private Well, were comment. you tasked with anything in that respect? Senator, when I'm tasked uh, about something for American foreign policy, I promise you this committee will know. Okay, and you weren't tasked with anything there? Senator, when I'm tasked with something by the President relates to foreign policy, I assure you that this committee will be made aware of yeah. it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your service to the country and uh, your time with us today. Uh, when you were last here, I asked you a question about uh, whether or not you agreed with Secretary Mattis that North Korea is the most urgent security threat the United States faces. In light of recent developments, do you still agree with that? At the time, you said that you did. Yeah, it's still, it's still a pr real priority. We also talked about, what, do you believe it's the most urgent national security threat? I do. Uh, but, but, but having said that, I, I don't recall the precise timing when I was here. Uh, I think it was in April, perhaps. Yeah, so, so it, it, it is. The fact that we're having conversations and we haven't had additional uh, missile tests and nuclear testing, yeah. uh, maybe it's still a priority. I, I don't know how to think about it, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we're, we're headed in a path that is the right direction and we just got to get the rate of change. The testimony, right. you used the term final, fully verified denuclearization. In previous testimony, you've used the word permanent, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. U.S. law says complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Uh, U.N. Res resolutions call for complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Are these the same terms? Do they mean the same thing? Precisely the same thing. Exactly. Full, complete, total denuclearization according to uh, U.S. law and U.N. Uh, security resolution. Yes, yes, Senator. Why the different words? Sometimes one needs to just break away. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Term. I'm happy to use the term complete, um, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Uh, yeah, they, they mean the same thing. Okay. Uh, the the, the CVID declaration or determination was that directly addressed at the Singapore summit with President Trump and uh, and Chairman Kim? 
It was. Uh, and it was brought up, those, the, the complete verifiable reversible denuclearization, why was it not in the uh, communique following the Singapore Yeah, summit? I'd rather not talk about the, the course of the negotiations and how we arrived at the language that we did. Okay. Uh, is North Korea still uh, moving, making advancements, undertaking a nuclear program? May I, may I answer that question in a different setting? You can't answer that question here? Yeah, I'd prefer not to. We'd, we'd love to provide that setting for you soon. Happy, happy to do it if we, if we need to. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Here, Senator, here, here, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cute. We're, we're engaged in a complex negotiation with a difficult adversary, and uh, each of the activities that we undertake is not going to be fully apparent to the world at the moment it is undertaken. And there will be processes and discussions that will be had that are important that they not be real-time disclosed. And as I answer one question and then choose not to answer another, it becomes patently obvious why I chose not to answer one or the other. And therefore, uh, it seems to me that a blanket prohibition on heading down that path yeah. is the only way to ensure that I have the opportunity to, to yeah. negotiate this thing in a way that isn't yeah. being done in the Washington Post and the New York Times. I understand. I, I think it's a very important uh, point of information that we get, though, to know whether or not North Korea is either uh, overtly, covertly, however they are doing it, making advancements in their nuclear program or still continuing uh, a measure of their nuclear program. I think that's very important for so, us to So to I know. did answer one question that, that touches on that at least. I answered a question, I think it was from Senator Markey, about whether they're continuing to uh, create fissile material and answered that indeed that they are. Um, the goal originally, I think, was a complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization by the end of the president's first term. Is that correct? Yes. Does that remain the goal? Yes. More quickly, if possible. Um, when will we know if North Korea is moving toward denuclearization, concrete, verifiable steps? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I couldn't tell you what day. And by the way, I'm guessing this group would disagree about when that moment took place, that it is a process for sure. Uh, and some will find uh, the first step along the way demonstration of, I think he said, substantial progress. Others may want to wait until we're almost done to declare substantial progress. So I, I can't answer that. It's, it's, it's definitely a process and, and will definitely take time. We've had a lot of discussions in this committee on strategic patience. The statement you use uses patient diplomacy. Uh, is the U.S. doctrine toward North Korea still one of maximum pressure? It is. I mean, uh, I'll tell you, there, that difference is a little bit subtle and, and perhaps I don't want to overstate the difference in the language. Um, here's what's different. Strategic patience was, in our judgment, standing around hoping that something worked right. Here we have a strategic objective uh, backed up with uh, diplomatic and economic pressure, which we believe gives us a pathway to achieve the objective and also an off-ramp in the event that we conclude that it doesn't work to head another direction to achieve the denuclearization of North Korea. Maximum pressure utilizes Section 102 of the North Korea Sanctions Policy Enhancement Act, which requires the president to initiate investigations into possible designations, uh, investigations of the possible designations of persons upon uh, evidence that they're violating, uh, you know, proliferating activities, et cetera, uh, so that we can apply additional sections. How many investigations into uh, new designations are taking place right now? I don't know how many, Senator, but, but let me try and answer your question in another way and say if this, is, if this meets the bill. Uh, it is the case that this administration is continuing to work on enforcement actions for existing sanctions, for the existing sanctions regime. That is, we're not going to let it wander off, we're not going to let it weaken, you can't rename a ship and get out from underneath the, uh, the sanctions regime. There are uh, active enforcement work being done at the State Department and at the Department of Treasury related to North Korea. So it's your view that there are additional North Korean or Chinese entities that could be identified under uh, for additional sanctions, is that correct? Oh, yes, sir. And th those designations are not being upheld or laid off? They will continue? We're going to use them in a way that we think increases the likelihood that Chairman Kim fulfills the commitment that he made to and, President Trump. And, and why haven't we seen any designations recently? Uh, I, I can't answer that question. I'd like to get an answer for that if we could. Um, has, has, has South Korea made additional requests to the United States uh, for sanctions relief as it relates to additional activities with North Korea? So I think the requests that South Korea has made are public and have occurred through the uh, committee up at the United Nations. So I think, I think the list of things that the South Koreans are requesting uh, in terms of uh, 
either making sure that their activity is consistent with the sanctions regime. There are exceptions. There's humanitarian exceptions, and so there are. And is the U.S. considering any of those sanctions, granting any of those sanctions? Um, we're reviewing each of the requests that the North Koreans made. We approved one. To the South, South Korea. To, I'm sorry, to the South Korea, yes. I'm sorry, thank you for the correction. We, we approved one that had to do with a military, military to military communications channel. Uh, the others are currently under review. Um, if we could uh, perhaps uh, get an understanding of what some of those uh, measures are, that would be great. Uh, you gave a speech, a very, very good speech, uh, Sunday, July 22nd, uh, on Iran policy at the Reagan Library, as you mentioned. Uh, if you were to substitute uh, the word uh, out, uh, Iran out and substitute in the word North Korea, would your speech still accurately describe the state of affairs in North Korea? Boy, it was a long speech, Senator. <laughs> uh. Uh, and basically, uh, yeah, I, I think in I think in large part it would be consistent. Uh, there, there is a difference um, in terms of their uh, operational capacity for their nuclear program, but the uh, nature of the two regimes is similar. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Before turning to Senator Merkel, I'm going to use a little bit of my time. I, you obviously um, acquit yourself very well, and those of us who know you and work with you have. Mostly, I know many of us, I include me, and I'll say most of us actually. I want to um, go with him this time. Okay. <laughs> we have tremendous faith in your ability to, to make things happen, and we thank you for all the issues you're taking on. You're building a, a great culture in the State Department, bringing on people that are truly exemplary. Uh, we feel the same way about Secretary Mattis. Um, the way he conducts himself and what he does. I think there's tremendous faith on both sides of the aisle in his abilities and what he does. So much of what you're hearing today has nothing whatsoever to do with you, and I would agree with you that the policies that we're putting in place in many cases are stronger than have ever been put in place. I agree with you. It's the president that causes people to have concerns, and, and I just, I'd love to have some insights into you as to, for instance, at the Helsinki conference to create an equivalence between our intelligence agency and what Putin is saying that shocks people. I mean, you can imagine you saw Dan Coates' response afterwards and your today, I think, candidly was related to what he said at Helsinki. And then the notion of even thinking about exchanging diplomats sending diplomats over to be interrogated by Putin, to even think about that, to let that be said as an official statement coming out of the White House to, this is my opinion, and I believe it's right, to purposely cause the American people to misunderstand about the NATO contributions and to cause them to doubt NATO and to, to really drive public opinion against NATO. That to me was purposeful, not unlike what happened right after Charlottesville. And then Article 5, to, to go on television and say, well, I, you know, why would we honor, I'm paraphrasing, but why would we honor Article 5 in Montenegro? You know, we passed a law, I think only two people dissented to send them into NATO. He signed it. I mean, it would be a dereliction of duty if, we, if he did cause that to be the case. So, why does he do those things? I mean, is there some strategy behind creating doubt in U.S. senators' minds on both sides of the aisle, doubt in the American people as to what his motivations are, when we, in fact, have tremendous faith in you? I think you're a patriot. Tremendous faith in Mattis. But it's the president's actions that create tremendous distrust in our nation among our allies. It's palpable. We meet and talk with them. Is there a strategy to this, or is it, what, what is it that causes the president to purposely, purposely create distrust in these institutions and what we're doing? Senator, I, I just I disagree with most of what you just said there. Um, you somehow disconnect the administration's activities from the president's actions. They're, they're, they're the one and the same. The, every sanction that was put in place was signed off by the President of the United States. Every spy that was removed was well, directed well, by the to, President Go to the points States. I just I mean, made. Go to the points I just I, made. I mean, Talk to them. Talk to them. I, I know what we're doing. Here, here, Talk to the here's points what the, I just here's made. Here's what the world needs to know. Okay. With respect to Russia, this administration has been tougher than previous administrations, and I fully expect it will. The President's own words were, 
He's happy to get figure out if we can make, uh, make improvements with respect to the relationship between he and Vladimir Putin and change the course. But if not, he'll be there. I, I'll get the words wrong. He'll be there. Toughest enemy, most difficult enemy. I, I, think, I think I can prove that that's the case today. I think I have. Yeah. And so somehow there's this idea that this administration is free-floating. This is President Trump's administration. Make no mistake who's fully in charge of this yeah. and who is directing each of these activities that has caused Vladimir Putin to be in a very difficult place today. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, you handle yourself in exactly the way you should, in my opinion, as it relates to comments. I, 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 I notice that you are not responding to what I'm saying. I think I, think I responded yeah. to everything that you well, heard, Senator. No, no, you didn't. And the fact is that yeah. you, you just didn't, okay? We, we and just the fact, disagree, Senator. No, we don't disagree. That, yeah. Hell, let's run the transcript again right. if you want to talk we'll, about it. But the fact we'll, is we'll let the world decide. It's the, it's the president's public statements that create concern amongst senators on both sides of the aisle. And I, I, I was asking you if, in fact, there was some, you know, some rhyme or reason that this type of distrust or discord would be created. And, and, and I, I know you, you're not going to answer the question, well, but actually, just, I'm trying to make a point yeah, as to why, know you are. why the I, open comments and the, and the questions and just the energy behind this hearing are what they are. It's not about you, and it's not about Mattis, and it's not what we're doing on the ground. Senator, you, you know, you, you went through a long litany of statements, but, but let, me, let me give you, for, first of all, I, I will tell you, you, I talk to the same allies you do. I speak to their foreign ministers directly. It is the case that they are behaving differently today. There's no doubt about that. They are now scrambling to figure out how to make sure that they are fully part of NATO. Some of that is a result of the statements that you referred to, Senator. Yeah. Some, some of that is, some of that is um, identifying Nord Stream 2 as a problem. I actually some, agree, some, with some, yeah, said, I agree with that. So, right, these, so, so these, these are the, well, there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll let the record reflect. I'll say some, of, the, some, the, some of the Some of these statements um, actually achieve important policy outcomes yeah. for the United States of America. Some of them do. Yep. And some of them are very damaging. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so, in response to Senator Barrasso's question on, on New START, uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit. Uh, both the United States and Russia came into compliance in February 2018, met the deadline on, on deployed nuclear warheads. Uh, and, but my I impression from your, your dialogue was the U.S. does not yet have a position on whether to work to extend the New START agreement past 2021. Uh, that, that, that's correct. It, but it, we, 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 we're very hopeful that we can achieve, the, we view them, these aren't, they are individual agreements as a legal matter and, and they can be worked on independently, but the, uh, the deterrence model, the underpinnings, the framework of these nuclear agreements, they are connected, whether they be things covered by New START, things covered by the INF Treaty, other, other, other provisions, they, they are of a part and it is the case that yes. we are, as we begin to evaluate, uh, how approach that we're trying to do in a holistic way. Thank, thank you. I, I think I can anticipate that this will be something that you and your team will be working on in the, in the year ahead, setting the groundwork for understanding the options there. Thank you. So Russia oil tankers reportedly supplied fuel to North Korea via sea transfer for several times in 2017. Uh, President Trump made a reference in which he talked about uh, saying that uh, what China is helping us with, Russia is denting. Uh, and then he said specifically also, Russia is not helping us at all with North Korea. Um, did this issue of, of Russia bypassing the, the UN sanctions uh, come up in the conversation between President Putin and, and President Trump? I think I can answer that question because I believe President Trump has talked about this I mean, in fact, uh, Russia's um, uh, commitment to help us achieve uh, denuclearization of North Korea did come up. The two of them did discuss it. And the centrality of continuing to enforce the UN Security Council resolutions, uh, resolutions that the Russians voted for, uh, were raised between the two of them. Um, I heard in a, in a subsequent meeting at which I was president, I heard Vladimir Putin reiterate his commitment uh, to doing each of those two things. And to follow up on your conversation with Tim Kaine about the communique 
from the Singapore summit and the, uh, the details that need to be worked out in regard to having a, a survey to just the starting point, if you will, of, of a detailed nuclear agreement. When you have an agreement regarding the details of how such a survey of North Korean missiles, nuclear materials, and so forth, when you have that agreement, will you brief this committee on that? Uh, Senator, I, I'm sure we'll be able to share some elements of that with you. I'm, I'm hearkening back to the uh, 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 Iran agreement, the JCPOA, in which they provided a declaration which was knowingly false. That is, the administration knew did not reflect accurately the history of the Iranian weapons program. Uh, I promise you I won't do that. I promise you I won't lie about the contents of their declaration. If we disagree, if we think they're wrong, we will, we will acknowledge that. Um, but, I, I, I'll have to think through precisely okay. uh, how and the appropriate way we would share that information with you. But you have my commitment not to allow a false declaration uh, to form a fundamental pillar of a nuclear agreement. Well, certainly, in the way that it did I'll tell you, we all had privy not just to a, a briefing on it, but to the actual document and, and details. And so we had that, that standard. In fact, those were made public as well. Would you expect to meet those two standards eventually? Uh, when the, of uh, when the agreement's agreement? complete, yes. I was thinking you were talking about sort of during the process. I believe those documents were made public uh, at the time that the legislation was being considered and when the agreement was final. Um, we, we hope to bring this agreement to Congress, and it is, of course, the case that you would need to see the underpinnings of that agreement. And part of that would be the, uh, the, uh, the probably be a series of declarations associated with you know, it. I'll tell you, it did, it did bother me some that because the deal's details haven't been worked out yet, that the, the president already conceded to setting aside the uh, joint exercises with South Korea. What are the South Korean leaders briefed in advance of that announcement? Senator, I'm going to leave that to the Department of Defense to answer. It would have been uh, conducted between in, in military channels. President Trump blamed poor relations with Russia on U.S. foolishness, and I'm, I'm surprised he blamed U.S. foolishness rather than Russia annexation of Crimea, of their occupation of eastern Ukraine, of their attacks on individuals in Britain, of their support of the Syrian government when Syrian government is using barrel bombs and gas on its own people, and, and given that Russia's uh, significant cyber attack on our elections. Do you believe that the poor relations with Russia is a result of U.S. foolishness? Uh, Senator, I think there are uh, countless reasons you identified uh, you identified several, I could go on, about the reason that we find ourselves in this place with Vladimir Putin and his regime today. Uh, not a good place, to be sure. A place that the president is working to develop a relationship to try and, re, to try and uh, reconfigure, at least at the level of making sure these two leaders understand each other and know how each other are thinking about the problem set. I think that's important and appropriate. And uh, okay, I, hopeful he can be I, successful I, in that. It's a nice essay. It didn't answer my question, but I'll go on. Uh, the president has also said there's no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea and that we could all sleep well. Uh, given that we don't yet have an agreement on even surveying the, the stockpile of what North Korea has, or an agreement on eliminating their weapons or their missiles, or an agreement uh, on uh, verification strategies, uh, Shouldn't we more accurately approach this from the viewpoint that there is still a nuclear threat from North Korea? The president's team is working to eliminate it, but it is still a nuclear threat as of today. Uh, yes, I, I think the president would agree that the uh, primary systems that have threatened America continue to exist. I think what his comment was was that the tension had been greatly reduced. Um, we're at a point where I mean, it was I'll, possible I'll take that, that there could be a, a miscalculation. I've got 20 seconds, so I wanted to ask you one last question on a completely different topic. Fortify Rights, a human rights group that traveled to Burma to document what happened at the Rohingya, came out with a report detailing devastating atrocities, which you've also seen from, from elsewhere. And we also have the report that Senator Brownback, our ambassador on religious freedom, is, is making. Is it time for the Senate to, to, to act on the sanctions against the Burmese military that we passed out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? I'll, I'll leave to senators to decide if it's time for the Senate to act. I can only say that you, the underpinnings that you describe, the atrocities you describe, are very real. Well, I would say this is the type of thing where executive leadership 
makes a difference in, in giving direction to this body. And, and so that's why I was seeking your and the president's opinion on whether it's time to really send a strong message against such ethnic cleansing and, and genocide. Thank you. Is it, can we expect such a leadership from the president I, or yourself? I, 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 I remember what Secretary Tillerson did before me on this issue. Um, you, can, you can be sure that we will be serious and lead on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Young. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your stamina. You've been here for quite a while. I want to let you know how much I appreciate uh, your leadership uh, as you've fit in, f uh, filled this role during this uh, tumultuous period in international relations. I have to say, since you've uh, taken this position, the interaction our office has had with members of the Department of State uh, and with you individually um, has really markedly improved, and, and so uh, I'm appreciative of that. One of the axioms of diplomatic uh, or military strategy is that uh, you want to unite your allies and, and divide your enemies. And as I see it, this is one of the things that Vladimir Putin has been succeeding in doing. He seeks to divide and weaken NATO, for example. He wants to divide the American people. And the more we make Russia's meddling in our own elections a partisan issue, I think the more we play into Putin's hands. The intelligence community has been clear and consistent. Russia did indeed meddle in our elections. So um, I think we need to stand together as Americans, not as Republicans or Democrats with respect to this issue. What are your thoughts on this matter, Mr. Secretary? Uh, Senator, I, I, think, um, I think it is the case that um, the Soviet Union and now Russia's efforts to undermine Western democracy are long and continuous. I think they occurred in 2016. I am confident that the Russians are endeavoring to divide, to separate us. Uh, from our allies to create space to find partners for themselves around the world uh, in the same way that we uh, will go out and, and, and work diligently with our allies. Um, I always think that having a, uh, a united United States, folks who come at these problems with seriousness and thoughtfulness towards a shared goal, increases the likelihood of America prevailing in these challenges, against these challenges. Well, I happen to agree with you, and, and uh, I just, I, I hope that um, my colleagues and I will, will uh, adopt a, a, a tone uh, and uh, approach to this very serious issue which impacts all Americans um, in recognition uh, of, of everything you just said. So, um, Mr. Secretary, just about an hour ago, President Trump convened a joint press conference with the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. And in the press conference, uh, the president and uh, both of the presidents uh, announced they were going to launch a bilateral U.S.-EU uh, set of negotiations with the goal of reducing tariffs, increasing economic cooperation uh, between the EU and the United States, uh, and working together to counter the predatory economic practices uh, that we've seen from countries like China. I can't tell you how encouraged I am by this. I, th I think with our, our collective leverage brought to bear, perhaps even ultimately pulling in other G7 countries like uh, the Japanese, we have a real possibility of uh, reducing the intellectual property theft, uh, reducing the incidence of a joint technology, uh, uh, forced technology transfer of uh, state-owned enterprises dumping things into our own economy, precisely the sorts of objectives I know the administration has. So um, do you agree that the United States moving forward has to prioritize a trade dialogue with the EU in order to eliminate uh, current retaliatory tariffs on farmers and manufacturers in places like Indiana, as well as to effectively combat uh, China's nefarious activities? Yes, don't forget Kansas farmers too. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't, I don't have the benefit of having seen the press conference. I, I was sitting here, I didn't, I didn't see the announcement or, or what they said. I know this was one of the things that um, President Trump was trying to accomplish in his conversations with uh, Mr. Junker. It sounds like they made at least some progress in that regard. Uh, look, the president has, has been clear with respect to trade policy. Um, Europeans won't accept our agriculture products. There are other markets that are close to us. He is endeavoring to get them opened. He is trying to drive towards zero, 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 right? Zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, zero subsidies. 
Uh, that's the place he's trying to get the whole world, and he is confident that when we get there, Americans will outcompete the rest of the world. And whether it's manufacturers or innovators or farmers or all of the above, uh, they'll ultimately be very successful, and there'll be enormous wealth creation, not only in the States, but elsewhere as well. Well, I, I'll just add that uh, I find uh, this effort of uh, working cooperatively with the EU and other major economies as, as coherent and, and workable uh, if we're trying to really address the greatest challenges, which is uh, those seen by uh, the state capitalist countries, uh, China being the worst offender. Uh, I don't have as much clarity with respect to our trade strategy as I'd like to. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I keep emphasizing I think we need to actually have a written one just as we do a national security strategy. But very appreciative of, of President Trump's uh, announcement today. Um, lastly, Mr. Secretary, I'd, I'd like to call to your attention that my home state of Indiana is home to 23,000 Burmese Americans. And as I travel the state and listen to so many of my constituents uh, that uh, our, our Burmese uh, uh, Americans, they, they reiterate to me three things. Number one, they express grave concern regarding the Burmese military's atrocities against the Rohingya, and they want to see those perpetrators brought to justice. Number two, they reiterate a desire to expand people-to-people -people ties between Burma and the United States. And thirdly, they express concern regarding the treatment of Chin Christians mm -hmm. in Burma. Now, I note that you're hosting this week the Ministerial to Advance uh, Religious Freedom focused on combating religious persecution and discrimination. And as we appropriately address within that forum the Rohingya crisis, I just ask the department to continue to also make clear to the Burmese government that all religious minorities, including Christians, should be respected. So, Mr. Secretary, will the Department of State work with my office to not only continue to our joint efforts related to the Rohingya, which I support, but also to encourage the Burmese government to end any policies whatsoever that treat Christians as second-class citizens? Yes, Senator, we will. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, I certainly associate myself with many of the comments uh, by the chairman. Um, uh, I think we've got an administration, a president who's making up foreign policy on a day-by-day -day basis. I think you've got a tiger by the tail. Uh, you have a difficult uh, and uh, enviable job, and I appreciate you spending so much time with us here this morning. We um, focus on words uh, from the president because um, our allies and our adversaries listen to those words and they calibrate their actions based upon those words. And uh, well, you're right that the president uh, about uh, 20 to 30 hours later did correct himself after the Helsinki summit to say that he did indeed uh, agree with U.S. intelligence services and not with uh, Putin. Um, five days later, he went back on Twitter and said this. Uh, so President Obama knew about Russia before the election. Why didn't he do something about it? Why didn't he tell our campaign? Because it is all a big hoax. That's why. So that's the most recent statement from the president saying that uh, Russia's interference in the election uh, is all a big hoax. So I guess my question is why shouldn't we accept this most recent statement from the president as U.S. policy rather than the statement that you referenced on July 17th? Well, Senator, I, 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 I can't go through the litany of all the statements you just gave. I, I have a list uh, from January 17, June 17, July 17, July uh, again, July 17, November 17, March 17. I'm happy to go through them, each of which the president confirmed that he understood that Russia had meddled in the election. And then I could, could give you, although I couldn't recount them, I could tell you numbers of times when I was personally with him where he told me directly he understood that. And indeed provided guidance to, at this time it was the intelligence community, but I think he gave similar guidance throughout the government that we needed to do all we could to push back on election interference, and I have a catalog of activities that this administration has undertaken to do just that. So then what do you make of his most recent statement? Senator, I'll, leave, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you. You can, you can speculate. You can draw whatever inferences you want for whatever purposes you so choose. 
Here's what I can tell you. I can tell our there's allies. No, there's no inference. I mean, it's a statement from the president in which he says that the Russian interference in the U.S. election is a hoax from July 22nd. That's, there's no inference that I need to draw from that. That's the president's statement. Senator, you are, you're, you are certainly trying to draw inferences about the Amer American policy, and I am laying out for you American policy. And I'm, I'm happy. Let me talk to you about what we've done on election interference, if I might. I understand that you draw a distinction between the president's comments and U.S. policy. What I'm trying to suggest to you and, is that um, what the president says is U.S. policy because our allies and our adversaries make decisions based upon those comments. And so let me try to drill down on uh, a specific issue that Senator Corker raised, and that's the comments the president made regarding our potential defense or non-defense of Montenegro. Tucker Carlson asked him a question, um, suggesting that Montenegro is too small to be defended, and the president responded by saying, I understand what you're saying. I've asked the same question. Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. Now, I know you are going to tell me today that the official policy of the United States is to defend Montenegro and to defend our NATO allies. Um, but can you understand why we would be concerned that the president would draw a question as to whether we would defend Montenegro? Because in the end, that is a communication to Vladimir Putin about whether the president is going to come to NATO's defense. As you know, an attack on NATO won't be a Russian army moving across a border. It'll be a hybrid attack, a disguised attack. There will be some question as to whether the United States should respond or not. So can you at least understand why um, we are concerned about the president raising questions about the utility of the United States uh, defending Montenegro? So the, the, I think the president's been unambiguously clear. Uh, and I can go read you his policies. And if I know, but I you're going to refer to his policies or the separate statements. I'm asking you about this Senator, statement. Senator, because you explain it to us. Senator, you, what did he mean? Senator, the policies are themselves statements as well. Indeed, they're the most important statements that the administration makes. Well, policies are statements, and statements are policies. It goes both ways. No, that's ways. not true. That's that's absolutely not true. But people make. I make lots of statements. They're not. They're not U.S. policy. The president says things. Right. The, the president makes comments in certain places. We have. We have national security council. We meet. We we lay out strategies. We develop policies. Right. The so president. How do I know the, the difference? president then sets the course. How do I know the difference between a presidential the, statement that is not a policy? And Senator, a statement that is. Senator, here, here's what you should look at. Com compare, I, compare the following. Barack Obama speaking tough on Russia and doing nothing. Those not were, true. It, it is true. I understand you want to rewrite the Obama policy on Russia, but that's simply okay, not true. Let's, you let's, organized let's, all let's of go. Europe let's and go, all Senator, of the world let's go, let's go task to, task. To, to, to put a comprehensive, unprecedented set of sanctions on, on Russia. So The man um, said he would have more flexibility after I'm not election. listening. My question isn't about, isn't about, I know you want to turn constantly back to No, I just to, want to look at facts and President policy, Obama. Senator. I'm trying to get to U.S. policy. It's what I do. I'm America's chief diplomat implementing U.S. policy. I think you. I think. I think you. I, I think you, do, you. You have been dealt a tough hand, and you do a, a credible job with it. Let me. Um, let me turn. Um, I, I just. Uh, let me ask a less adversarial question to to to, to end with. Um, I think. I think um, one of the, you said two very important things on North Korea. Um, you said that they have agreed to denuclearize, and that they understand our definition of denuclearization. That's um, correct. What is most important is that those two statements link, is that they have agreed to denuclearize according to our definition of denuclearization. Is that your testimony today? The definition was set forward and denuclearization was agreed to. I don't know what else to say. I, I I, I'm, I'm not trying to, I, to give you a hard no, time. I'm just trying to understand. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to articulate what, what's been agreed to. We, we made clear what we viewed as the scope of denuclearization. It's not dissimilar to what the UN, how the UN has characterized and how the South Koreans have characterized it. And uh, when we did that, the South, or excuse me, the North Koreans said, yes, we agreed to denuclearize. So your understanding is their commitment is upon our definition? Uh, yeah, it is, Senator. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before turning to Senator Isaacson, the, so, so in essence, the communique that we saw uh, coming out of the Singapore meeting, that, that is the sum total of the agreement we have with them. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, we've also had conversations after that. It is also the case that that agreement incorporated the Panmunjom Declaration, 
which in turn incorporated previous inter-Korean inter agreements as well. So the Singapore summit is stacked on a series of agreements, um, each of which is encompassed within the agreement between President Trump and Chairman Kim. So you can look to the, the full breadth and scope of those agreements about things the North Koreans have committed to. Yeah, and uh, look, I, I don't think any of us would expect that there would be a meeting in Singapore and all the issues would be worked out. I think we all understand it's going to take a, a long, a long time uh, to get this all worked out. Uh, Senator Isaacson. I spent all week trying to come up with intuitive, brilliant, incisive questions to ask you, recognizing how intelligent and articulate you are. And I ran out of And we've been listening to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo ask, answer questions from lawmakers. They've been grilling him over the details, especially of that two-hour private meeting President Trump had with Russian President Vladimir Putin, as well as other foreign policy issues, including North Korea. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero, in for Elaine Quijano. President Trump and his top diplomat dealt with differing versions of the administration's foreign policy on Wednesday. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo faced questions from the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee. And one day after proposing a bailout for farmers hurt by his administration's tariffs, President Trump said things are going well on the free trade front. Already today, the United States and the European Union have a $1 trillion bilateral trade relationship, the largest economic relationship anywhere in the world. We want to further strengthen this trade relationship to the benefit of all American and European citizens. This is why we agreed today, first of all, to work together towards zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, and zero subsidies on non-auto industrial goods. Thank you. Thank you. Things looked a little different on the Hill. Senators pressed Secretary of State Pompeo on what happened during President Trump's one-on-one -on -one meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin last week. They also had questions about the status of talks with North Korea. Here's Nicole Killian with more on what you may have missed. We really need a clear understanding as to what is going on. Only translators were in the room when it happened, but lawmakers want Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to tell them everything about President Trump's private meeting with Vladimir Putin. I asked a simple question. I hope we're going to get through it. Did he tell you what transpired in the two-hour meeting? I've had a number of conversations with President Trump about what transpired in the meeting. It's been more than a week since the Helsinki summit, and the White House has been vague on details. Senators asked if the president promised to relax.